You wouldn't believe how, actually how, how satisfying it is to have people come to security talks. When I did my first security talk 15 years ago, there were literally two people in the room and one left early. <laughs> so thanks for coming. Welcome. Hi. That's not the spirit. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, exactly one year ago, uh, it was Brock and me, I think even in the same room, giving the same talk, or at least the same title. Uh, has anyone been to this talk one year ago? A couple of people? So we were toying around with some ideas, and uh, we, sh we showed some early prototypes, and uh, people said, like, Where, where's the code? Where's the code? Can, you, can we have the code? And um, we, we, didn't real, we, we, we didn't really feel comfortable by the time to handing out the code. So we said, no, there's no code. So kind of this talk is the story kind of what happened after, okay? So for the last 12 months, so to speak. And um, the whole problem space is this. Um, Brock and I have been working for many, many years on this thing called Identity Server, which is an open source uh, implementation for OpenID Connect and OAuth, and uh, it basically solves the authentication problem. So whenever you need to authenticate users and you have a, f you know, a reasonably complex system, then Identity Server is kind of like a Swiss army knife for implementing uh, authentication and single sign-on and all these things. And um, um, even, if, you know, e even if that sounds intimidating, <laughs> Authentication is easy, yeah? because, because once you know all the facts and all the requirements, it's pretty much like there's only one right solution to solve the problem. Um, whereas authorization, there are so many opinions and styles and, and different approaches that might bring you to the same solution. Yeah? Um, so basically, ultimately, after the customers were done with authentication, it's like, okay, so now where is your open source library for just doing, you know, app.use authorization, and I'm done. And that didn't exist, okay? So, and the main reason why this probably will never exist in, in the one line of, of code thing, right, is because it's, it's very, very application specific, whereas authentication is something more universal. So, our typical, you know, our, our kind of, um, answer was always, yeah, that's application specific. You have to write something that is exactly working with your application. And we never really had the time to say like, okay, so is there something, is there a common ground that would be worthwhile abstracting into a more general purpose library or even pattern or approach? And um, that's what we basically were thinking about to start with on a background thread, kind of, uh, and then for the last 12 months, more, more, um, more full time. And um, that's what this thing is called, uh, um, called policy server. So what, what this talk is not, this talk is not really about policy server. Uh, I, I don't want to sell you anything. It's more like why we made the decisions that we made while implementing a reusable authorization library. Yeah. Um, and, um, Maybe that's some inspiration for you guys as well. So, um, the slide deck you can find on speakerdeck.com slash least privilege, and it, it has all the links in there, so that's um, what you should download if you want to know uh, more details. So yeah, so policy server. Um, we, we, we started building this uh, open source library, um, and then it became more complicated and more complicated and more complicated. And we made a split basically between um, there's a, an open source version of Policy Server, which you can get from, from GitHub. And we also have a commercial version now, which has, you know, the enterprise -y stuff. Um, so the, the way we approach the problem is since uh, we have the luxury of talking to many different companies, right? So, so we started asking them all, yeah, like, how do you do authorization? How would you do authorization if you had the chance to do it again? How are you planning to do it for the next application you're, you're writing? And um, the funny thing is, when you ask 10 people, you get like 15 different opinions, because no one was really ever happy with what they did. Uh, kind of like, yeah, we, we, did, we did it like that. It worked out well in the beginning, and then we started hacking around this and hacking around that. And either we had not enough or we were too ambitious. Um, um, regardless, uh, typically our observation was that people re reinvented the wheel for many times. 
um, um, for the next application and the next application. And um, you know, like, um, and not a lot of people went for the last mile, so to speak. Yeah, once the library was done, kind of it was working. Uh, they never took the took the time to build a UI over that, or maybe an API, or maybe something to manage the, the their authorization rules. And you know, many many times their UI was SQL Server Management Studio. So, so we asked them, and um, there are there are many approaches, right? Um, but um, the the free the free most common things we saw and that are working is basically role-based authorization, right? I mean, that's a no-brainer. If you are in the marketing role, you can launch the marketing application, um, which is pretty coarse-grained. Um, the next typical abstraction um, we are seeing is permissions, right? So you maybe, you know, can do this or can do that or, you know, is allowed to do this. Um, um, sometimes permissions exist independently of roles. Sometimes you're using roles to group permissions together, like if you are in that role, that gives you automatically this, this, and this, and this permissions, for example. And then in your code, you can you know, do, do more fine-grained checks, for example. Um, the other style is uh, more like a resource-based style, right, where you have resources in your system, like a document or a contract or a customer, and you attach like, you know, like access control entries to it. Yeah, pretty much like uh, NTFS does that in, in Windows, yeah, like where you have an ACL uh, that hangs off a file or a directory, and there are some challenges with that, for example, um, inheritance, yeah, like uh, what if the folder has these ACLs, what, what you know, should that, you know, go, um, go down to all the containing objects and so on. What do you do with, um, Orphaned ACLs, right? So what, what, what if the guy leaves the company, but he still is in the ACL? Uh, it will be an orphaned entry, and you often see that in Windows as well, right? When you're opening, like, uh, uh, in NTFS, like, look at the ACL dialog, and there are numbers there, but not a name. That means the guy has left the company in between, and all, all we have is the, the SID in there, but the account is gone, for example, yeah? And permutations of that style. Um, queries versus commands is another interesting challenge, right? Um, most authorization frameworks we've seen, they deal only with commands. Yeah, like, am I allowed to do this? Yes, then do that. But what if you, like, you know, like, um, give me all the contracts that I'm allowed to see, yeah? It's very, very specific to um, the data store you're using, yeah? Um, some people inject where clauses in SQL statements, you know, things like that. Um, I've even seen a product which I think was <laughs> an interesting idea, but I think it's crazy. It's a, it, it, it was a TDS reverse proxy, so basically something that sits between your application and SQL Server, and you do your queries, and this guy basically adds the where statements dynamically. Uh, um, so these are the things I've seen pretty commonly, and I think that's what you can say is how typically you approach authorization minus the very, very specific things that are really, really specific to your company. Um, what I've also seen is um, that it's very, very easy to blur the lines between authorization and business rules. Yeah, like, uh, where does authorization end? Where do business rules start? Where, where does, um, you know, like, core business logic kick in? And putting business logic into authorization rules, I think, is, is, is not going to work. And the best example I have for that is this thing called Exacamel. The, uh, even the name is hard. Uh, extensible applic Access Control Markup Language. Has, has anyone ever used that, Exacamel? I don't see anyone. One guy is waving, okay? So, Exacamel tried basically to externalize all kinds of business rules and authorization rules to an external system. So whenever, basically, you wanted to check a rule or something, you had to export context from your system to the external system. Now the external system had to pass the context and then they had to write rules and return you an answer. And um, that feels overly complicated, yeah? You are basically, it feels like you're spending more time making Exacamel happy than yourself. <laughs> yeah, so um, that, is, that is the first example from the Exacamel documentation. That's the simplest rule you can write. 
Okay? And it only uh, specifies if you can log into an application between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Okay? So one person recently said, that, yeah, but they now support JSON as well. Yeah, I, I don't think that makes it any better, okay? So I don't think, and given that only one guy was waving, uh, it, it wasn't a huge success in the long run. Many people try to use it in the first place. I, I don't think, I, I think we need, we, we need better separation of concerns. So our observation basically ended up saying we have three different types of authorization. One is more like, you know, like, uh, am I allowed to use an application or am I allowed to use an API, for example, yeah? Uh, that often can be handled at a, at a global policy style level where you, in your application, have a global, a global authorization rule that, you know, makes sure that only the, 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 the user coming in is, is allowed to do, uh, is allowed to come in, actually, yeah? Um, at the API level, you can often manage that um, with the tokens. I mean, if you, if, if you don't have a token for an API, you can't call it, right? That's one thing. Um, once you are in the application and you're trying to access a specific feature, then I think the role permission resource style works pretty well. But once you are inside the feature, right, um, and now it really is all dependent on the parameters you pass in, or the payload, or, you know, like, um, uh, properties of the things you want to modify, I think that is business logic, and not authorization logic anymore. And I think um, there's nothing wrong with writing app-specific uh, authorization frameworks, but I don't think you can generalize that because it's so application-specific. So that's one thing. Do you remember this guy? Windows Assy Man, not S Man. <laughs> um, Windows Assy Man um, um, was shipped with Windows Server 2003, and it took uh, four years for someone at Microsoft to write an article about it, as you can see, and it, it was the best kept secret. Yeah? And the idea, we, uh, I liked Windows Assy Man a lot. If you go back on my blog to 2004, or something, I wrote crazy integration stuff for ASP.NET, web forms at the time. Um, so what I liked about Asiman is, is that basically um, it g gave you a, an additional layer over your identity system. So the identity system is Active Directory because, you know, it was AD times. Um, and Active Directory, I, I hope I don't tell you anything new, was never designed to be an application authorization mechanism, right? Uh, when they designed Active Directory, they had users and groups, and you can basically control access to printers and file shares and these kind of things. But it, it was never designed to be, you know, like uh, that, that AD groups become authorization mechanisms for applications, okay? That's why they created Asiman, yeah? And Asiman basically... Um, sources the users from Active Directory. So basically, you, you can create groups, or well, first of all, you, you, you can create applications, okay? So, and applications can have application groups, and they can, or, or roles, as they call it, and you can have, um, roles can be assigned to tasks, and tasks can even, you know, go down to operations. Um, and then you can add a AD users to those roles, okay? So it, it was a separation of concern between the identity system and the authorization policy, which I think is the right way to do it, yeah? And the other reason why many people liked it was because it had a UI. <laughs> yeah, it was built in into Windows, and actually, I was surprised, um, it still exists. <laughs> um, it seems like um, they removed the ability to create authorization stores because it's deprecated, but you can still open them. So if you have old ones lying around, um, but yeah, um, you know, nothing ever goes away in Windows. Um, so I guess Asiman is one of those things as well. Um, so when we thought about uh, how policy server should work, we, my idea was, I, I want something like this, but you know, like teleported to modern application design. Yeah, so where it's not dependent on Active Directory, where you, uh, you know, have um, 
modern protocols like OpenID Connect and OAuth, where you have a claims-based identity, um, and where you can basically use an arbitrary identity system, um, not, a, not AD or whatever, um, just w whatever you want, and have something that sits on top of that. And doesn't, you know, uh, many vendors try to sell you like identity and access control software where you lock into the whole stack. Your users must be managed by them, your per uh, the, the permissions must be managed by them. It's all being buried in one system. I don't like this. Um, what I want is that you can choose an arbitrary identity system and can layer your authorization on top of that. So, now, now, given that this architecture is really common these days, your people have identity providers, um, there is some discussion going on now, what to do next? Yeah, so how do we distribute, or how do we make authorization rules, like roles, uh, application roles and permissions, and these things available to applications? And one, one opinion is a very common one, it should go into the security token. Right, so uh, we, 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 all, we already have this thing that issues tokens to our application, so why not just piggyback on that mechanism and stuff in our authorization policies in there as well? Um, a couple of products out there do that, and, and that, that's their, their style of doing it. Um, I don't, to be honest, I, I, I don't like this approach. Um, because I've seen it go wrong so many times. So let's have a look at, at this token here. Yeah? So the token, uh, a security token typically contains information about the authentication, yeah? like uh, who issued the token, um, how was the user authenticated, when was he authenticated, and where can you use that token. That, uh, that, uh, that I would say is authentication metadata. Um, it contains identity, yeah? uh, for example, what's the, uh, the user ID of the user, and maybe you have some other data you want to ship around, like a display name, for example. Um, and then this, and that's something I don't like. Okay? So tokens should represent the caller and the user and where they can be used and identity information that describes those three parts, okay? That, that, that's my mindset, at least. Now, permissions clearly don't fall into this bucket, okay? Um, delete data, okay? Manage customers, right? Change treatment plan. They are all pretty, pretty generic things. And um, one, one uh, fact is that in uh, OAuth, for example, you see that, the audience here, a token can be used at more than one API. Yeah, so you have maybe, uh, you know, like um, back in WS star, you were used to get getting one token for API 1, getting a token for API 2, getting a token for API 3. The style these days is more like you get one token, and it, in, inside the token, you define where it can be used, so you have one token for multiple APIs. Huh. But what if now this guy has the delete data permission in API 1, but not in API 2, for example? Yeah, so um, maybe when you start designing that, this makes total sense to you, and then you start adding APIs to it, and then these permissions become ambiguous. Yeah, and um, you start shipping them around. And um, uh, le le one thing I learned from um, experience is adding claims to a token is super easy, right? You just write a one line of code, hey, new claim, job done. But removing a claim from a token because you realize it, it, it was the wrong claim or the semantics are wrong is super hard because you don't, well, often you don't know who started taking dependencies on the existence of the claim or even the semantics. Yeah? So I don't like this. The other problem is um, with tokens is that typically tokens get created at authentication time. Okay? So when I log on to a system, um, I'm doing my OAuth dance, getting my tokens. Um, what happens if two hours later, for example, or, or even shortly later, my permissions change, right? The only way to update this is getting new tokens, yeah? Um, for example, in Windows, Windows has the exact same problem, yeah? So when you log on to your Windows machine in the morning and then an, an admin adds you to a group, the only way to make this group membership effective for you is to log off and log on again, because they collect 
your group memberships at login time. Okay? So if you have things that often change, tokens are definitely not the right vehicle to, to ship them. Yeah? Um, and the last one is this, this section here, roles. Roles is a, a, an often discussed thing. Yeah? So should you put roles in a token or not? So in my mind, there are two types of roles. Um, one I call identity roles. Yeah? So basically, um, in this case, the doctor role, for example. Yeah? So when you, uh, when you log onto the system, you are a doctor. Well, you are a doctor. It's part of your identity. Okay? Um, but a prover? What, what does a prover mean? Yeah? I mean, what does he approve? And depending on to which API I'm connecting, I might be able to approve different things. So the, the approver role, my, in my mind, falls more into the authorization bucket than into the identity bucket. Yeah? Um, this is kind of like a hospital scenario because one of my customers that inspired the whole thing did hospital software. And when a user logged in to the system, they always got one role, doctor, nurse, or patient. Yeah? And there was never a situation where the doctor was a nurse or the nurse was a doctor. Um, so for them, it made total sense. And that, that I think, is part of the identity of the user. Yeah? Um, same as like with your... Um, your, your passport, right? So on, on, your, on your ID card, you have a date of birth claim on it, right? Um, it doesn't have a claim on it says allowed to drink alcohol. <laughs> because the rules change depending on which endpoint you're talking to, right? So in Germany, it's 16, depending on what you're drinking. In, in the States, it's 21. Um, someone recently said in, in Ireland, it's eight. Um, <laughs> so, so the... The, uh, the allowed to drink permission is something that is handled at the bar, right? Or the API endpoint, if you like. Whereas the date of birth is something universal. And that's where I, in my mind, make the, make the distinction, right? Identity is something universal. Authorization is something application specific. Okay? That's at least my mindset. Um, I know that there are many products out there which, which do it exactly like this. Um, you know, um, that's just my, my opinion. Oh yeah, and to be honest, I've seen many companies that started out with that, and then it got completely out of hand, right? Because you started to putting permissions in a token, now we add more APIs, more APIs, more APIs, more applications, the tokens get bigger, bigger, and bigger, and that wasn't the intention of, of, a, of an access token, right? An access token should be a, a, a compact data structure that you ship around so that you can get access to, to APIs. So yeah. So what, 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 what if I would use this token that I just showed you in my hospital scenario with the patient API, the oncology API, and the cardiac API? I'm really hoping that the same doctor who has the change treatment plan permission in oncology doesn't have the same permission in cardiac, because he's probably not, not uh, qualified for that. Okay? So yeah. So that is, you know... What I, in my mind, is identity is not permissions, and I think you shouldn't mix them together. It might look sensible to start with. It will get out of hand once your system is growing. What I think is the case is that identity plus a permission system, that becomes the actual authorization data. And um, so that led us to basically... basically um, designing the architecture in a way that you, have, you, you, you should have two distinct providers. Um, the identity provider and the authorization policy provider. And I'm not saying this must be a server or, a, or an API, whatever. Just think of that as logical functions in your, in your architecture. Um, so the way I think, we think, it, it, it works really well is you know, the first step is the user logs onto the application, he authenticates with the identity provider, he gets his tokens, the identity token for the client, the, uh, the access tokens for the APIs. Then, op then obviously, the client, the UI, has certain authorization requirements, like, you know, showing this button or, you know, removing this menu item, whatever. So the UI would connect to the policy provider, send in the user's identity, get back the UI-specific permissions, and when the UI talks to the APIs, each API will have, based on the identity of the user, probably different authorization requirements, so they also connect to this policy provider, and they, 
and there where you get the authorization data from. Okay? Um, and then if you put a nice UI on top of that, you make many, many people happy, right? Because suddenly uh, an, a non-technical person or a non-developer can change those rules without you having to recompile your code. Yeah? Or think of software that, that you're shipping to customers, right? That the end customer should have a, a nice way to, you know, to configure who is allowed to change the treatment plan and who's not, okay? So, so basically how policy server works is, and that, that regardless of the open source or the, or the, 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 the commercial one is, that, that, that we have a, um, a runtime, a, a client library, so to speak, yeah? And the idea is that the client library uh, takes the identity of the user, which is the thing that falls out of the authentication process, and sends it to a rule store or, or a policy store, whatever you, you want to call it. The important part here is the application context, right? So different applications might have the same user, but depending on the context of the application, you might get back different permissions. Yeah? And, you know, and we didn't try to do any rocket science here. Yeah? Like it's, it's a simple API call. You send a list of claims to the server, you get back roles and permissions job done. Okay? Um, so that was the first part how, um, about how, how we designed that. Now the second part, which is to completely independent of if you're using policy server or whatever, or building your own, whatever, is some strategies how to integrate that uh, into client applications. So obviously, the, 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 at the, the very most basic level, um, you want to have some sort of client library, right? So um, something that the client application or the, the APIs can call. Obviously, um, you can be as smart as you want in that client library. Maybe you don't want to do a network round trip every time. Maybe you have some caching. Maybe there are freshness requirements depending on the application, right? So one application might say, ah, my, my stuff changes infrequently, so give me a, a, a fresh policy every hour, whereas maybe, you know, like in the emergency room, the, 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 the permission to cut open a patient is something you should check <laughs> right now <laughs> and, and don't wait for an hour for that, yeah? Um, so that's one thing. Um, let me show you that first. So... What we have here is a really, really simple, and, and that, that's all on GitHub, um, have a really simple application where you can log in that simulates your identity system, okay? It could be anything. It could be Active Directory, it could be Identity Server, it could be whatever, you name it, okay? But the outcome of authentication will always be claims, yeah? Um, so we have two users here, Alice and Bob, obviously, um, and all the other users are patients, as you can see, because they are very sick, okay? So when we log in here, <laughs> let's, let's, let's use Alice, then all this page is, is, is showing basically is the identity of the user, right? So. Um, in ASP.NET Core, you have these so-called schemes. That's the password scheme because I came in via a password. And I have two claims. One is the subject ID of Alice, which is number one, and her display name, okay? So um, in this case, I'm having my authorization policies in a JSON file. Could be anything, right? Could be an API, could be a database, whatever. But basically, um, that's where we map the identity to application data, yeah? So in this case, you see we have two roles here, or three, doctor, and nurse and patient, yeah? There are, um, there are a couple of ways how you can map users to application roles. One is static mappings, obviously, right? If you have all the, the usernames or the subject IDs, you can just put them into application roles. Um, and another thing is, is dynamic mapping. So when the identity system um, emits a search and claim, for example, we can automatically map him to the, to the doctor application role, yeah? Or you, you could come up with arbitrary expressions, yeah? That's what we do in our commercial product where you can just write C-sharp code, yeah? Um, and it then basically, based on the incoming claims, you map them to, to arbitrary application roles. Um, you see here the patients. The patients don't have any static mapping at all. 
So anybody who, who, who has an identity role of customer is a patient from our point of view. Okay? Um, and then here in this section, you have the permissions. Um, so we have a, a C patient and a perform surgery permission, and we can basically specify who is allowed to do that. Um, perform surgery is done by the doctor. Uh, request pain medication should only be done by patients. Okay? So, and then in my, in my view here, um, oh, that's not what I wanted. We have basically a service living in the DI container, the policy server client. Uh, we, we are reading the policy from the JSON file in this case, and that makes available um, a policy server runtime client object that you can now inject into the constructor. And then you can just call that by saying evaluate async, and you pass in the claims that you want to run the evaluation on. And that might be your current user, which is, uh, in this case, is the current user, right? But we, you, you can pass in an arbitrary claims principle. So if you want to construct an identity on the fly and say, OK, what would this user or this identity be allowed to do? You could do that. Or if you want to figure out what other users are allowed to do, you know, same idea. So when we run that again, OK, so now we are seeing the, the results of that policy. So it's uh, Alice is a doctor, so he has the doctor role, and we, ha we have the free, um, the free permissions that she has. And if I would remove Alice, um, you know, just uh, say it's not one and two, it's uh, three and two, then obviously Alice wouldn't have those permissions. That makes sense. OK, so, you know, if you're writing a brand new application, this might be all you need, right? Um, you're having this client library, you're calling into it, and based on that, you're building your, your logic. Um, another approach you can take, um, and I'm not, to be honest, I'm, I'm not a fan at all of the authorized attribute with the roles equal something, because I think this leads to really hard to maintain code, because, you know, that might work well if some, um, person on stage demos that with, uh, with one controller, like, like, like I'm doing right now. Yeah, but uh, once you have more controllers, you know, many controllers, and you have these roles sprinkled <coughs> everywhere, it's really hard to, to main, maintain that code. Um, but I, and that's the other thing I learned while talking to customers, many different people have different styles, okay? And I guess I have to accept that. Um, not always my style is the best, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Um, anyways, so let, let's say you have an existing investment into, into the authorized attribute, okay? Uh, or you just like that, or maybe you want to use, you know, um, um, the built-in .NET APIs that work with claims like, you know, find first and find all and has claim and all these things. Um, another possible way to approach that um, would be to automatically call the policy system. So one other thing we have here is a middleware, yeah? And all this middleware really does is it runs after the user has been authenticated, um, and it takes the current user, calls the policy system, gets back, um, gets back the permissions and the roles, and turns them into claims, OK? Um, so when I run that again now, um, with, the added, with the added middleware, I should see an, another authentication scheme in my application. One is the identity, the password. That's how we authenticate it. And the other one is called, you know, policy server middleware, whatever. So in, in other words, um, that's um, a low-level feature of claims principle. Um, if, you, if you have ever seen that, claims principle can act as a container for multiple claims identities. So you, you, you don't need to have only one identity in your principle. You can have more than one. So, and in this case, this one here represents the authentication data. In this case here, it represents the permissions and the roles, OK? And now, since they are now claims in the principle, you can use um, you know, your, your beloved authorized attribute uh, with the roles equal something. Or you can just say, you know, user dot has claimed this, or user dot, you know, whatever. Yeah? So that's the nurses only action, whatever nurses only means. Um, so if I would 
execute that. I'm a doctor. I shouldn't get access. Okay? But if I'm a nurse, now, now I'm a nurse, I should be able to do whatever nurses do. Okay? So that's um, another approach. Yeah? Um, or you come up, or you know, if you have the luxury of using ASP.NET Core, they have a new built-in uh, authorization API, which is actually far superior than what we had before. Um, it's called policy-based authorization, and now the word policy gets completely overloaded. But the point is, um, you know, my, my main points of criticism with, with, the, with the authorized attribute were that you are coupling together authorization logic and controller logic in, in one place, that the, the, the developer at development time already needs to know who will be allowed to call this code, which might not be the case. Um, so separation of concerns um, and testability, right? I mean, have you ever tried to write an automatic test that makes sure you have the right authorized attributes in the right place? It's, uh, it's messy, okay? Um, so we were talking to Microsoft for many, many years and said, like, listen, we need something better than this, yeah? Um, but they didn't have the luxury of doing breaking changes so much until ASP.NET Core <laughs> came by, where they exercised that luxury quite a bit. Um, and we gave them a prototype and said, like, OK, here's our prototype. Can you make it pretty? And the, the main blocker back then to make it pretty was that the lack of dependency injection in, 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 in ASP.NET. So when they released ASP.NET Core, um, they also had a new security guy on the team, which happens to be a friend of mine. Maybe that has helped. Um, and he basically took that and, and put it in, into the product. And it, it's called policy-based authorization. And the idea is uh, it, it, it tries to solve all the, the pain points, uh, mainly the decoupling of authorization logic from your actual code and the testability. Yeah? Um, oh, and by the way, the, the, the most common question I get when I show that is like, oh, does that also work with uh, MVC5 and Web, Web API? And the answer is yes. Uh, there, there's a guy, David Parks8, uh, who backported the whole thing to, uh, to Katana. So you're now, you can use that now in, in pre-ASP.NET Core um, code. So how does it work? The idea of the policy system is that you can, uh, as I said, separate the policy logic from the actual con uh, controller logic. So the idea is you're putting these so-called authorization policies into the DI container. You give them a name, and policies are basically a list of named requirements. Yeah? Um, so you can basically say, OK, um, to be able to prescribe medication, the, the, the user must be authenticated. He must have a permission of prescribed medication. But you can make these policies arbitrarily complex. Yeah? So you can, um, you know, could call a database or wh wh whatever you want to do. OK? So let's just copy this guy um, over um, to my code. Um, here, okay. So now, now I have a policy called prescribed medication. Um, I think in my code I call it differently. Let's have a look. Um, oh, yeah, it's called perform surgery. Okay, whatever. Prescribed medication. Prescribed medication. Okay. Um, so what happens now is this: when I hit the the prescribed medication function, it basically looks in up the DI container, finds that policy, executes it, right? And if the policy is, uh, succeeds, you are allowed access. The nice thing about that is now that, um, that when your requirements change, you only have to change them in one place, and all the controllers where you're using the policy gets, gets the updates for free, so to speak. Um, so with that in place, so have a look. Um, you must have the permission of prescribed medication to call this thing. Um, let's have a look. If I log in as a, as a doctor, I should have the, this permission. And that's working, OK? Whereas if I'm a patient, uh, Dan, who, who is a patient, you know, he shouldn't be allowed to do that. That makes sense, OK? Um, so that's a nice system. and. Um, as I said, it's, uh, it's extensible. Um, I'm going to show you an example of that in a second. Um, 
Oh yeah, the other nice thing I like, I like about the new policy API is that you can use it programmatically. So I personally am not a huge fan of attributes. I never understood why .NET developers so much love their attributes. I mean, it's code above the method name as opposed to code below the method name. It's, but it's code, right? Um, so the nice thing about um, the new policy API in ASP.NET Core is that it's just a service in the DI container. You can get a dependency on your I authorization service here, and then you can call these policies imperatively. Yeah? And again, what's nice is you can pass in the user you want to test against. Okay? So it can be the current user, it can be a different user, um, and you're getting back a true or false, basically, and uh, can act on that. Okay? And that is basically um, A, the you know, the, the, the authorized attribute ha has a pretty static behavior, right? Yes or no, more or less, yeah? But what if, let's say, um, you wanna, if he's not allowed to prescribe the medication, maybe the, the, the user should be able to see the list of medication that has been prescribed, but not be able to add something to it, right? Then the authorized attribute wouldn't work here. So here with code, you have all the flexibility you need. The other nice thing about that is that now you can test your policies automatically, right? So you can now write automated tests, you create users with certain claims, yeah, shapes and forms, you feed them into the policy and you can make sure that you get back the expected results. Yeah? And when some other person six months down the line has the task to extend the system and he changes the policies, your tests will show him immediately if he broke the policies or, or not, right? So that's, I think, very nice. The other thing you can do, which I think you shouldn't do, but um, I'm showing it nevertheless, um, is you can now do dependency injection in Fuse. So you can uh, get, a, get your I authorization service in Fuse and r conditionally render UIs based on the permissions of the user. Yeah? I don't like this approach too much because it, you know, more code on Fuse, which I think is uh, not necessarily the best idea. Um, but I've seen that being used quite for a good cause in, ma in layout pages, right? Where you have like your master navigation system and maybe based on, um, on the user properties, you are showing different things, yeah? um, The only thing that's weird now, yeah, with this approach is when we look back on our, um, on our policy uh, definition here is now now that you have to create a policy for each permission you have in the system, which I don't think is the, the, the right thing. If you want to create a policy which is more complex and a, 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 as a part of that checks a permission, that's fine. But if you have like a one-to-one -one mapping from policy names to permission names, that doesn't sound like the right thing to do, or at least it, it, it's a bit tedious, right? So. There's a nice feature in ASP.NET Core, which is called an authorization policy provider, just to make it even more uh, or confusing. Yeah? And the idea is that, um, you, that there's an API that you can implement that uh, creates authorization policies on the fly for you. So you don't have to statically define them, but basically you, you get to see the name, the string, and then you can create them or fabricate them on the fly. So what we did with, um, with that feature is, um, when I add that here, it wires up a, a so-called policy provider, and now whenever the policy system sees something like this, it first checks, is there a statically defined policy in my application? And if not, I'm just going to create one that just checks for the permission with the same name. Okay? That's quite nice. So even if this policy is now not statically defined, it should still work. And you can see that it works because I don't get an exception, because otherwise I would get an exception here. Okay? So it, it, it still works as, as expected. So that's quite nice as well. Um, and the last thing I think I want to talk about is uh, custom requirements. Um, so mm, the one thing I don't like <laughs> about the policy system is not the policy system itself, but the way it's mostly presented. And it gives you the impression that to check something with this API, you, you need claims for that, right? Um, so you, you, you want to check that, that whatever, create a claim for it, put it on the claims principle, that's how it works. That's not how it works, yeah? Um, it's just what Microsoft gives you out of the box, yeah? This, this require claim 
uh, method is actually an extension method, and you can write your own extension methods, which uh, wire up your own custom um, requirements. So that would be a custom requirement. Yeah. So, so let's say, um, in addition to the prescribed medication thing, you 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 need more input data. Yeah. Like uh, what kind of medication do you want to prescribe and how much of it? Okay. Um, and to do that, you just derive from I authorization requirement, which is just a marker interface. It's, it's for DI purposes. And you model your domain data. And then, basically, the, the, the trick here is, is that you're writing a class that checks the, uh, the, the requirement at runtime. So you see, basically, here, it's an authorization handler of T. And the T is your custom requirement. And what we are doing now, we are inside the custom requirement handler. We are using our client library to now check permissions, right? Which makes total sense because you're having this client library and you can use it wherever it makes sense. Um, so you can see that the, the logic is a bit contrived here, but you know, if you have the permission of prescribing medication, that's good. If the, if the amount is less than 10, you are allowed. Otherwise, you need to be a doctor. And if it's a placebo, well, the, the, the nurse can do it as well, regardless of the amount, right? Um, and when, when you have this guy, you put it into the DI container here. Yeah, that's the medication requirement handler. And then whenever you are invoking um, um, a, a policy that has this requirement, your handler will be called and you are allowed to run whatever code you need to run to come to an authorization decision. So let's see. Um, here's the prescribed medication action, right? It has a name and an amount. You are newing up this medication requirement object, and then you're passing it in in the authorized async method. Here's the user, here's the requirement, and again, it will tell you, is this allowed or is it not allowed? No? So I guess when I run that again here, uh, I, am a, uh, um, <laughs> I am a patient, so I can't, I can't do anything here. Let's go back uh, and be uh, a nurse. Okay, so prescribe 10 milligrams aspirin, that works. 20, shouldn't work, okay? A ton of placebo, yes, works, okay? So that's how you can encapsulate more complicated authorization rules into these uh, requirement handlers, and then you give your developers a pretty, you know, a, a, a simple to use um, API, authorize async, user, requirement, and then, uh, you know, magic happens. Okay? So that's the other thing. Yeah, we've seen that. The last thing I want to mention here uh, with regards to ASP.NET Core is there are also global uh, ASP.NET Core authorization policies. So the same policy system that you've just seen that you can put into DI, you can also hardwire to MVC. It's an MVC feature, really. Yeah? Um, so basically, inside, when you, when you call add MVC, you have these options, action, and then you can create a policy. And this policy can be arbitrarily complex. Right? It can be easy, like only authenticate users. It, it can be a little bit more not so easy. Or it can, again, include custom requirements, which makes custom code run, and so on. So you can make it as sophisticated as you want, I guess. Um, and then you're just putting that policy on an authorization filter and attach that to the filters pipeline, and then it will run for every incoming request into the application. Um, and that's, you know, also quite useful to have. Okay. So, coming back to my slide, yeah, that's my summary. Again, you might come to, to different conclusions. That's, that's just how we think uh, it, it works for us, and we have implemented it a couple of times successfully in, in different projects. But, you know, if it's all about global application access, use a global policy, yeah, use uh, access tokens. If it's about feature access, I think roles, permissions work really well. Once you are inside the feature, yeah, um, I don't think it's authorization anymore. I think it's business logic. And to be honest, the, the, the medication example I gave you with the amount and uh, the type of medication, that is already pretty crossing the line, I think, to, to business logic, right? Because you probably, if you're building hospital software, you probably have, as a core business feature, an understanding of how much a, a, a patient can take from which whatever. So it's, you know, it's already already might violate this, right? Which, what I'm saying is, it's pretty easy to get that wrong, yeah? Um, how much time do we have? 
10 more minutes. So what, what I can quickly show you is this. Um, the UI we, we created for that, which is not part of the open source version. Um, but you know, you, you, you need UIs to make uh, managers happy. Um, nope. OK, so same idea, just that you now can graphically manage these things. So this would be our same example as, as we've seen in the, in the code, right? It's the emergency room application where we have doctors, nurses, and patients. And you can see that, um, you, see that you can assign users to application roles, either statically by user IDs or by virtue of mapping incoming roles into it. Or here's an example of... Uh, of, an, of a C-sharp expression, so if the, if the person is very sick, he must be a patient, okay? And then you can go to the permissions and assign that here. Um, another example would be a more complicated one. Again, this, this was inspired by my customer that builds hospital software. So, so, so they start with a single application, right, and build their own uh, authorization system, build their own authentication system, and now they, they created the second one and the third one, and now they needed to share users between those and give them single sign-on. So that's where identity came in. But now they realized even the, uh, the same doctor has access to free systems but has different permissions, so, so they built three times a permission system for each application. So the way we can solve that, for example, is with hello, with child policies, OK? So we have a top-level policy called hospital system, right? And you can have your user mappings on top, like who's admin, who's back office, who are employees, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but you see no permissions here, yeah? This is just a container, and then we have sub policies, which are the actual applications. Yeah? So in medical records, you know, you have things like create, delete, update. Um, in accounting, you have pay invoice, whatever. And now you can use the roles and users you had at the top level to map them to permissions in the child level, for example. Yeah? Um, and I mentioned earlier that some people like the resource-based view of the world. So that's something you can do as well. Um, so in this case, I'll, let's say GitHub yeah, would use our software. <laughs> they probably will never do that, but anyways. Um, so GitHub defines a couple of you know, roles and permissions like you know, owner and contributor and you know, you create repo and merge PR and these things, right? And then when uh, Dominic creates an account with GitHub, you could create a child policy called Dominic. Yeah, and then when Dominic creates a repo, that could have a child policy called repo1. And now Dominic could, you know, in the UI, uh, allow, I don't know, Philip to merge a PR. Okay? And that's more like a resource-based thing, yeah, where you uh, attach permissions to, to a resource tree in your system, and you can do inheritance on that as well. Yeah? So that's our current thinking. As I said, it's, uh, it, it, it's a bit of a brain dump of... Um, of the things we, we did for the last year. It works so far, I must say it works really well. Um, as I said, um, the, all the code you've seen is on GitHub. So if you like that pattern, yeah, just take it, um, um, change it to whatever you want. Um, um, here you can also see the, the documentation for the ASP.NET Core policy system, um, which is quite good. And the first one was a blog post I wrote two years ago that kickstarted the whole, the whole thing. That's all I have. Thank you very much. And because I always forget, there are stickers. Thank you. <laughs>